I'm back from Japan alive. So let's get to the second bonus topic of math for game dev, the series in which we normally go over subjects in math that help a lot for game dev. But just like with quaternions, since this is a bonus topic, that doesn't really apply. However, unlike quaternions, today's topic, boids, will be a much shorter video. Thank God. Before we jump into the video proper, two things. You can get the UE5 project, yes, Five, I've finally gotten with the times, from the GitHub repo link in the description. And while this may be a math video, it has a lot of technical considerations. The math behind it is remarkably simple, but once we start dealing with hardware, we have to do some things to make it really sing. So while we'll start off by talking about voids, we'll also end up covering data locality, big O notation, and octrees. Boids, a portmanteau of birdoid, yes, really, were first developed by Craig Reynolds in 1986. It is in fact so old, you can even read the SIGGRAPH article it was first published in for free. See the description for the link. Boids were developed to describe flocking behaviors, with starlings and their murmurations being the go-to example in nature. As you can see in the footage, this murmuration of starling moves in a complex way. Each individual starling coordinates with those around it, so that way the murmuration as a whole appears to move with a singular intelligence. Reynolds' insight was to individually simulate each member of the flock, and when each individual was simulated, the complex flocking behavior arose naturally. Boids are used in Abzu to simulate all the fishies. They add behaviors to model predator-prey behavior and also avoid collision. Abzu is extremely pretty and it is a really chill game. There's a great GDC talk that covers the tech technical art aspects of Abzu because you gotta do things differently when you have thousands of dynamic thingies on screen. So if you are planning to use boids for thousands of something in your game, you'll probably want to crib their notes in order to keep a playable frame rate. So what are the rules Reynolds lays out for proper flocking behavior? At the core of it, there are just three. Separation, alignment, and cohesion. In English, that means that each individual boid should 1. Not hit its neighbors. 2. Attempt to match the velocity of its neighbors. And 3. Stay close to its neighbors. I could add additional rules that add behaviors like follow a leader, avoid collisions with the environment, and so on. But these three are all I need to hit the ground running. While Reynolds doesn't give specific functions for these rules in the original paper, one of the distinct advantages of covering a topic that's almost four decades old is that other people have already implemented Boyens dozens of times. So I am shamelessly riding on the shoulders of my intellectual betters. I've borrowed a pre-existing implementation See the description for the link, and set it up in UE5. It's quite simple. First, I've set up the separation, alignment, and cohesion behaviors for each point actor, along with some simple avoid the floor and stay within a given radius behaviors. Next, I needed a convenient way to get each boy, so I set up a world subsystem with an array that each boy just adds itself to in its begin play method. Super simple. Now, I'll just copy paste my way to a humble 256 boards and my scene and bada bing bada boom it works however those among you with computer engineering know-how should be reeing right now while this works it's far from ideal i can group all my actors together in memory so that way things are a little more efficient and this is actually extremely simple in fact i'm mostly done since i already have all my void actors in an array in my void subsystem, I'll just update each actor from that subsystem instead of each one individually. First, I just change my void subsystem into a subclass of tickable world subsystem so that way it gets a tick method of its own. Then I just copy paste all my behaviors from the voids individually into my void subsystem. Finally, I just loop over each void in the existing array, updating all of them from within that loop. And when I run it, eh, it's a little better, but I can still hear your reads. To figure out which boids are the neighbors of an individual, I have to check all of them, and I'm really just interested in those close by. If I were to double the boids from 256 to 512, I'd be quadrupling the amount of work, because each boid has to check every other boid. This probably makes more sense with some visuals. Here I have four cubes in Blender. Let's imagine each cube is a single boid. At the moment, to update an individual
individual Boyd, it has to check every other Boyd. I'll duplicate them into columns to demonstrate that visually. And then I just repeat that update for every single Boyd. Now, if I double the Boyds from four to eight and repeat the same process, we now have 64 cubes in total instead of 16. Since you're all master mathematicians after watching the original Math for Game Dev series, <coughs> you did watch the original videos, right? You should be able to tell that the number of evaluations is increasing exponentially, specifically it squares. So if I were to double the number of voids, I'd have to do four times the work. Tripling would lead to nine times the work, and so on and so forth. This is where big O notation comes in. Big O notation is used to describe how an algorithm behaves as the volume of information it has to operate on increases towards infinity. If an algorithm's work increases linearly with volume, it's big O n. If it increases squarely, then it's big O n squared, which is our current void algorithm. Basically, you just find the most computationally intensive step of an algorithm, and that's its big O. If you're ever in doubt, draw it out, or really just look it up. You don't have to know each algorithm's big O perfectly. Just a general feel for them should be plenty good to steer you away from writing terribly inefficient code. So if we look at our current void update set, Setup. The problem is that in order to update an individual, we have to check every single boy. When again, we're just really interested in those close by. Now, since we are just interested in those close by, I can reduce the algorithm's work by storing boids that are close to each other in space, close to each other in memory, thus reducing the number of boids each individual has to check. So instead of using an array, I'll use an octree. What is an octree? An octree is a tree of nodes. I'll get back to this uh, video later. Cheers! In graph theory, a tree is an undirected graph in which any two vertices are connected by exactly one path. The various kinds of data structures referred to as trees in computer science have underlying graphs that are trees in graph theory. Although such data structures are generally rooted tree, a rooted tree may be directed, called the directed rooted tree, either making all its edges point away from the root or making all its edges point towards the root. All right, let's see what happens when we press play. An octree is a tree of nodes organized spatially, and the leaf nodes hold all the actual items. An octree subdivides its nodes dynamically, so that way spaces with more items get more nodes. This way the overall number of items per node doesn't get too high, and the converse is that volumes with less items have less nodes. Octrees are great for local queries since it stores elements that are close to each other close to each other. I've implemented a simple octree here that just stores pointers to void actors. Now, since my void's positions probably change each frame, that means I'll have to either one, rebuild my octree each frame, or two, appropriately add and remove nodes and move elements around just to keep the octree kosher each frame. The latter sounds like a lot of work, so I'm just gonna rebuild my octree each frame. Now, I can just retrieve the local actors needed for my void updates instead of having to check all of them. And again, if you're interested in my simple implementation of an octree, check the description for the link to the repo. You could definitely make a much more robust, better octree using my basic code as a launching off point. And if we run it using the octree, hey, it works even better. Now, there are a bunch of other ways we could optimize it, such as using static mesh instances, which I'll probably cover in an Indie to Indie episode, or setting up a kind of entity component system for the boids, but I'll leave that for you to do. I've created these quick and dirty geese with basic vertex animations so that way I can pay homage to Vine. Okay, oh, those and that's it for this video. I hope you didn't mind the shorts I uploaded while I was backpacking through Japan. I'll probably try making more shorts in the future and unless I hear overwhelming disapproval, I'll make a short of my Grand Canyon trip as well. As you can tell, I survived Japan, which uh, there were some extremely risky moments. I did not fall 40 feet off a mountain trail and break my legs. In fact, we all made it out alive with some great stories to boot, which I'll share with you guys when I don't feel like making 
a regular video. I also went to a lot of bakeries in Japan and I took a lot of pictures, so I'll be doing a Japanese bread review soon, eventually. And maybe I'll even do a what I packed slash what I wish I packed kind of video. But anyways, I'm rambling. I'm really just glad to be back in the groove of things. As always, thank you for watching. I appreciate your time and I hope you have a good day. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. And if you want to follow along with my now back to usual fortnightly release schedule, please subscribe. The next video is going to cover how to do long division because apparently it's not really taught anymore in public schools here in the US. Also, your comments are great. It was a little tricky in Japan with just my phone, but I tried to read and respond to all of them. There's also a Discord server. Check the description for the link. I'm also on Twitter or X or whatever it is now, but not on my phone. So I haven't really been Xing lately. But once I bake something, you just know I'll X about it on X. So if you want a sneak peek of the baking segments, X me on X. And speaking of baking segments, let's get to it. Oh my god, we are still in the pizza arc. Oh my god. Well, as you can see, I have not done this in a while. <laughs> as you can see, this is just a cheese pizza. And yeah, it's just plain cheese pizza. However, again, I made everything myself. It's good. It's, it's, it's good. It's just mozzarella. And the trick here is you gotta shred it. You can't just slice it. Otherwise, it, it's, it messes up. You want like a random pattern. If you slice it, you get a lattice. It doesn't work out great. And if we look at the bottom, mm, nice leopard skin. You even get a nice little sneak of that AeroPress I got. It's good. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Pizza. I'm so excited about this. I'm even gonna do another day in the pizza arc because yeah while it's delicious it is you know it is just cheese there's not really i like it it was good it was tasty not much to talk about unfortunately so next in the pizza arc we have this beauty right here and um i my notes for this one say it is 90 percent hydration and that it was that it's just too high hydration for me to work with um it was which is why it's not as not as round a shape as the other ones and it's also why i think um it didn't get as uh many many nice little leopard spots on top because it was just too moist there's too much water in it but i mean it was it was still delicious uh i believe i'm using uh this might be fresh mo yeah this is definitely fresh mozzarella here and it's got nice basil some pickled peppers and um prosciutto just absolutely delicious and um if we take a peek at the bottom yeah i got some nice leoparding not that much, not that much. And yeah, the that that cornmeal, mm, that's a lifesaver. But anyways, going back at the, the top, yeah, this this was a delicious, just a truly delicious pizza. Like the fresh mozzarella makes such a huge difference. Like I don't know what it is about it. It just tastes really good. And unfortunately, it also kind of like if you eat it, try taking a bite a little too soon, it's going to just melt your mouth because it's just hot it stays hot i don't know why it's just hot but it's really tasty like it just tastes so much better than um the other matcha it's just a huge difference in flavor flavor and let me say let me tell you oh my god one thing you know what my my single complaint about japan the tomatoes there were terrible they're just bad tomatoes like i ate a day on the on um the flight from Hawaii to Japan, they were just shoving food down our gullets, was which was great. A and A Airlines, amazing. They were just the beer's free, the wine's free, and they're just here's like every two hours, like hey hey, here's another meal. And they had I would like some cherry tomatoes with one of the meals, and I ate it, and it was terrible. And I mean, it makes sense because Japan, it's so wet there. It's never really, it's never really dry enough for good tomatoes. So. While I was in Japan, I just didn't eat pizza or like or or like you know um, any red sauce pasta because it was just too depressing, too depressing. So I came back when I got back, I ate like eight tomatoes. Honestly, the first day I got back, well, it was, I got back too late, so I didn't eat anything. Like I got back at like ten thirty, I just I just ate some bread and went to sleep, and then but the second day I ate like eight tomatoes. And then after that, I was, like, averaging, like, four tomatoes for, like, the next few days until I got my tomato <laughs> fill in. I'm like, all right, no more tomatoes for now. But, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably going to make pizza again because I'm still thinking about tomatoes. And I don't know. I don't know. But in Tokyo, there were, like, there were Italian restaurants everywhere. You could tell because they were all flying the Italian flag. And But, like, I was like, oh, no. 
the tomatoes here are bad. I'm not even going to bother. This is going to be depressing. And it was. <laughs> Anyways, I'll do the next pizza uh, because it's just, I only took a single picture because it's basically the same picture or pizza, excuse me. Uh, the only difference is, again, I'm still 90% hydration, which is too damn high. Uh, the only difference is I brushed olive oil on the crust before baking and trying to get a little more, I don't know, a little more soul in it. Uh, again, it's just 90% hydration. It's just too much. Anyways, still delicious. Prosciutto. You know what? I might, I might grab some prosciutto next. I might just eat tomatoes and prosciutto for like the next week. I don't know. Anyways. I, I mean, I just gave you three days of the pizza arc because I missed I missed you all. But anyways, that's that's enough for this episode. The yeast in the air is free. Go out there and bake. And when you go around the world, go to bakeries. See what their bread is like. Because you know what? Not all the bread's the same. So the bread you make is special because it's unique. It's your bread. It's good for you. It's delicious. It makes a great gift. And it's a great way to show people that you appreciate them when you share it with them and i appreciate all of you so i will thank you and i will see you next time